Hi everybody, David here. I'm going to do a little video from within Gravity Sketch. Um, I'm on my Quest 2 headset running the Oculus version of Gravity Sketch on PC and that's why you see me as an avatar. I've got this external camera thing. Uh, this is a 3D model of the Apple Vision Pro headset, um, as far as I can remember. It's not a super catchy name. Now you can see what it's like. Um, I grabbed this from Sketchfab. Um, there's two artists that have put this together. It's kind of amazingly accurate. It's amazing that this kind of stuff pops up immediately um, on the internet for free download. So, um, sorry, I'm going to maybe, or can I use the beta browser? Ooh, it's not in this version. I was going to just browse to Sketchfab to show you who the artist is, but I'll, I'll put it in the comments afterwards. Yeah, my name is David Thompson. This is my channel, Democratizing 3D. Um, I talk about XR, I talk about 3D digital spaces and uh, 3D digital models. In this video, I just want to give a first impressions of this headset. I watched the live stream last night, not fully concentrating because my kids were um, going to bed and there was a lot going on in the house, but I got the gist of it. So what is it? Um, as you can see here on the Gravity Sketch um, mannequin head, it's a pretty big, um, you know, goggle style headset. Um, it's aimed at what Apple calls spatial relative computing. So they're not really calling it an AR or a VR or an MR headset. They're calling it a spatial computing device. That means, I think what they want to say with that is that this device is aware of its surroundings. Um, so that's one aspect of spatial computing. The other aspect of spatial computing is that it allows you to do your computing um, in the space around you. So you're no longer doing computing on a rectangular screen. Um, so let me just bring in a simple bit of geometry here. So we're all kind of used to doing computing uh, either, you know, on a phone like this format, a rectangle, or maybe an iPad like this or a laptop or a desktop that we do all of our computing on rectangles, right? So Apple are trying to say they're, they're going to blow that away. Um, I think they will do a lot um, to get the, let's say, humankind towards that. Um, from my point of view, of course, this has been a journey that started quite a long time ago. You know, Oculus, um, Windows Mixed Reality, all of those teams have pretty much, and Google, of course, have pushed the boundaries of spatial computing since way back uh, 2011, kind of around about that time, it really started to kick off again. Um, so a little bit more about the device. It's a fairly large device, as you can see. Um, I can go in here and take it apart, I think. So, um, yeah, it's got a big black piece of glass across the front. The interesting thing about this is that that's actually a screen as well. So you'll be able to see a video recording, a live video recording of people's eyes as they are behind this. Um, and that's supposed to make it a little bit more comfortable to talk to people without taking the headset off, both for them and you. So that, you, of course, you're able to see them because it's a pass-through device. So just like the Quest um, Pro and the Quest 2, um, it's going to use the tracking cameras to allow you to see through the device. Um, but this is unique in that you've got this, uh, what they call eye vision, I think. And it allows, or eyesight, I can't remember, allows you to see the wearer's eyes through it. So that's one of the things. So that's a piece of glass. Let me see if I can take that off. Uh, oops, probably taken off too much. That's a piece of glass. Um, behind it, and you can't see very well. Let me see if I can do this a bit better. Behind it is going to a bunch of microchips and stuff, um, but you can see a little bit better here. So this 3D model is not fully complete, but it does. it's very representative of what the, I saw on the live stream last night. So there's a bunch of cameras uh, on this device. So there's cameras on the top, there's cameras on the bottom here, two cameras um, on the front there, or maybe three, one, two, three, um, camera on the side, as far as I can tell. Some of these may be cameras, um, sorry, that's not a camera there. Some of them are cameras and some of them might be other kinds of sensors. So they did mention that they're going to have the LiDAR sensor like you have on your um, Pro devices today. So the, the, the phone Pro or the iPad Pro. Um, and these cameras are pretty important. So like the Quest 2 and the Quest 1 and the Quest Pro, um, they use these cameras for tracking. So tracking where your head is, where this device is in the space. 
But I think what Apple are doing with these cameras, especially with these front facing ones, they are effectively scanning um, what's in front of you. So you're, they're using hand tracking, which will be enabled through these cameras and these bottom cameras, as far as I can tell, because they showed hand tracking when your hands are you know, down on your laps. Um, so if you want to browse you know, some photographs, you can just put your hands in a relaxed position on your laps and kind of flick through things with your, your, your uh, hand gestures. The cameras are also going to uh, effectively scan your surroundings. So like the HoloLens 1, HoloLens 2, and probably the Quest um, 3 at least, they will be continuously creating a 3D model of your surroundings. That model in turn is used to place objects in 3D space. So if I put something here, then it stays there, whatever I do. When I come back to this room, it will be in the same place. Um, and that's something which you know Microsoft really coined around their mixed reality um, uh, operating system, saying that, well, we can put a window here, which is email. We could put a window here, which is the news app, for example, or the weather app. Um, I can put another window here, which shows my YouTube, and they will stay there every time I come into this room. And that's only possible through all of these cameras, which are creating this 3D model um, of your room at the time. Um, something this this model doesn't have, of course, is all this inside architecture. But what they did show is that there's a M2 chip in one side, which of course is a very powerful chip, very efficient chip that will allow. Um, I mean, this thing is going to take some power to run because it's got a 4K per eye headset. It's for um, screen display, as far as I remember. So it'll need that power to do that processing. Um, on the other side, they've got an R1 chip, I believe it was, which is going to do the sensor, f sensor fusion. So basically, as I just explained, these sensors, these cameras and sensors will be taking videos and effectively creating a 3D model of the room around you. They'll be looking at your hands for hand tracking. They'll be figuring out where the headset is in space all at the same time. And that R1 chip is going to enable some of that pretty heavy lifting to do that. And it should make all of this stuff just work super seamlessly. Um, behind, uh, let's see what the, <clears throat> you've got the two lenses, of course, the displays will be somehow on uh, the microchip board, whatever. Um, and yeah, the significant thing here, let me just turn the head off, will be that inside here on these eyepieces, you're going to have. Um, eye tracking. Uh, so this is basically going to be a ring of sensors, cameras um, that are going to be looking at your irises. So just like the Toby eye tracking that you can get on VR devices today, or some of the more bespoke stuff. Uh, I can't remember if Vario are doing bespoke stuff, but they basically have cameras and sensors that track your iris very, very, very accurately. So that's going to allow you with these cameras to control this device simply through using your eyes by pointing at things and then using simple hand gestures to basically click on things or do swiping. Um, let me see if I can get my quest to pick up hands. This is a bit of a bug in Gravity Sketch, but yeah. So um, Quest 2 has pretty good hand tracking. It's getting better all the time. Um, let me see if I can get rid of this menu. So sorry about that. Right. Um, and you can use this hand tracking to do some basic things on the Quest. But what we're expecting from Apple is that that hand tracking is significantly more precise. Um, you know, you can see the hand tracking looks very precise. It's tracking my fingers. There is a, a slight delay in this. And as you can see, when I tried to close my fingers together there. It can work out that my thumbs are actually touching each other there. So it's got the fingers slightly offset. So it, it, of course, the cameras only have a two-dimensional picture of the hands. Apple have had this for a while, I think, where they've got the face camera um, depth sensing cameras on their phones already, and they might be able to solve these problems and have like a 3D model of the hands that's a little bit more accurate. Um, so the point was that you'll use your eye tracking in order to pick things on apps, so basically like your cursor, and then you'll use very subtle um, like air tapping gestures in order to um, confirm things or select things. And I also saw like basically using your finger to swipe through a list of photographs, for example. And I think you'll be able to use, you know, like multi-touch gestures like 
uh, Zoom or Pinch, I'm not too sure. Um, but the key is that the sensors on this device will enable a quite a different paradigm of using hands as an input device. So everybody's gonna be interested in how that works. The whole idea is to reduce friction. If you wear a VR headset today, you'll or, or try a HoloLens 2, for example, you'll see that, um, well, yeah, you have to learn the controls or the hand tracking doesn't work properly. You know, if Apple nail this UX paradigm of just using eye tracking and hand gestures and simple, small, non-tiring gestures, then they will make a computing platform, at least from that input point of view, that's comfortable to use for everyday computing. Um, you know, I think um, hand controllers are really good for gaming and things like Gravity Sketch, where you need a, effectively a stylus and some precision, but that's probably not what everybody wants to use for uh, typing or just using devices. People don't want to have to pick up two extra bits of hardware with batteries in them that have their own you know, firmware and all that kind of stuff. So that is a key feature of this device. Um, yeah, the use cases, what did they really talk about? Well, they talked about, um, let's put this back together actually, <clears throat> see if I can, yeah. can I remember? Yep. Yeah. Let's put the device back together so I can have it as a nice background here. Uh, I think I want a different angle. Yeah, there you go. Um, the other things that they showed and talked about with this device, um, well, where this, the use cases weren't super strong, so excuse me, this is just hand tracking, uh, going back off. They basically talked about 2D use cases. So they really showed somebody sitting um, with the device in pass-through, so lose hand tracking again. All right, I used to work really good in Gravity Sketch, you could just do the hand tracking. Um, yeah, so they, they showed people basically wearing this device, but with full pass-through on. So you're basically looking through the device. It's effectively an augmented reality device. So you can see your surroundings around you. You don't bump into things. You're not um, closed off to the real world. And then they showed people placing windows effectively. So let me grab <clears throat> this window, uh, you know, into the space. So they said, okay, maybe I want to have my YouTube here. And then I want another one. Uh, another window over here, which is going to be, I don't know, email, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So they basically have this paradigm, which Windows Mixed Reality operating system had uh, way back in 2017, where you could put your apps into space and they would stay there. And you can do that, of course, in things like Mozilla Hub, Spatial, uh, pretty much all of these kind of collaborative apps um, allow you to do these kind of things today, uh, workspaces, immersed, et cetera. Um, so that's part one, that's nothing new, but I think, of course, Apple will be able to make that basic paradigm of Windows and 3D space work far more compelling and in a more streamlined way because they've got all of their integration with the Mac that's in your house, the phone which is in your house, and of course, maybe the iPad which is in your house. So you can work on something on your iPad, on your phone, drag and drop it or send it to your glasses, put your glasses on and you'll have your work environment ready to go. And I think that kind of reduction in friction of computing cross-platform, not cross-platform, cross-device computing will just make the glasses a little bit more attractive because you can just slide uh, a video that you're watching onto the glasses and then watch it in immersive mode or whatever. Um, the other concept they have is not just the 2D Windows. I'm going to delete this because it's duplicated. Sorry, or this one is duplicated. Um, so the second kind of part they've got is that you'll be able to bring in effectively volumes. So they're saying that some apps will be in a volu volumetric mode. Sorry, I just hit my headset on the head there. Um, yeah, so some of the apps that you might want to be using will be in effectively volumetric mode. And they showed... Um, 3D videos and photographs, as far as I can tell, that you can record that will, when you're running the app, the app will run in a little uh, cube like this. So it'll be a three-dimensional content, but it'll be kind of restricted to a box. I'm not too sure why they've taken that decision. And then, of course, the third type of app you can have is something that's effectively all around you, so a fully immersive app. Um, it could be maybe just as simple as bringing in 3D model or some content into your space, you know, placing chairs down onto your uh, living room that you're seeing through the device. 
um, or maybe just having a like a map coming in, like a, a Google Maps kind of app coming in around you. Um, oh yeah, the other thing I've got to tell you about this is um, this is one of their key features. So on the top of this, you'll see a kind of a crown bezel-like button. And the idea is that you can turn this button, physical button, to tune in how much reality you see or you don't see. And they're very much talking about reality with this device in their marketing. So they're basically saying, you know, you'll be primarily using this in reality mode, which means you're looking through the device, seeing what's around you in color, probably very sharp or very clear, um, but you'll just be using it like an augmented reality device where you're uh, grabbing in, you know, 3D objects or windows or apps and placing them into the space around you. Um, however, if you, for example, want to watch a movie, then you can dial that round and dial out the background, the reality, so that you're sitting, you know, somewhere contextual to watch the movie. Uh, the other example they showed is somebody on an airplane, you know, you dial out all the, the people around you so you can have your privacy and, you know, watch your thing in, in a more immersive um, way. And of course, that's basically a dial between augmented and virtual reality. But that's not the way that Apple are, are marketing it for probably for good reasons, right? Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about the device. You know, it's obviously got loudspeakers here, which will be amazing. They're going to have spatial audio. So I think what they've learned through AirPods, they'll be able to do kind of amazing things where you can hear things in a distance and you'll be able to figure out where it is as well. That'll just add to the immersive experience. Um, they said they're going to have a partnership with Unity to develop content. Um, yeah, what else? Um, I think one of the big challenges is that Great that they work with Unity to allow people to port their immersive experiences to this device. But when you don't have controllers, a lot of games developers or even you know things like Gravity Sketch won't work very well because they rely on the precision of the controllers or just having you know the buttons. Um, so a lot of developers are seeing, at least in social media, are kind of scratching their heads trying to figure out how they develop for this this device. Um, yeah, just to wrap up, the, the main thing I think about this device is that it's fairly big, bigger, I think, than everybody expected or hoped for. Um, it's fairly obtrusive. That will put people off. Um, there's loads of innovation going in there. I think they'll nail, you know, the eye tracking and hand tracking uh, UX paradigm. Um, yeah, and the, the key thing is going to be what the ecosystem of app developers does with it. So they're going to release, they haven't really talked about what they're going to release with, but they showed an app store, Rec Room was in there, um, just to show that they can you know, take Unity apps. Um, but I think because the platform is so powerful in terms of the sensors that you've got here, um, the ability to scan your room both from an audio perspective or an acoustic perspective and a physical visual perspective so, that, so, so to recognize some of the objects around you, I think that platform will give app developers over time something really, really powerful to develop for. Um, Greg Fodor, I think it is, from formerly from Mozilla, somebody I follow on Twitter, has a very good long-form tweet about this. You want to read it. Um, he's basically saying that augmented reality devices, which are see through the screen. So basically you're looking through a computer vision synthesis of the outside through these cameras uh, compared to looking through an actual piece of glass like the HoloLens or the Magic Leap. Um, these kind of devices are gonna ultimately allow like loads more use cases um, because they'll, if you look at Snapchat filters and these kind of things which you can do on a camera app today, where you can effectively blur out somebody's body and replace it with a robot, or blur out somebody's face and replace it with a, a, a you know a gargoyle's head. That kind of computer vision technology is is going to be perfect for devices that you look through the silicon basically, um, because you'll be able to do things like replace. Um, you'll be able to control exactly what you're looking at. So one example is, let's say you're doing a FaceTime call with somebody you know who's standing in a a typical you know, living room, they've got a window behind them. Um, in theory, you'll be able to blend out what's outside your apartment and replace it with um, you know, the Caribbean or spaceships flying around or whatever you want. And of course, we've seen this already in Snapchat's filters, you definitely be able to blend out somebody's face, replace that with something else. Um, there was a, a slight 
um, kind of nod to this in one of the gaming examples they gave where somebody, you know, pulled up their hand and had this big metal gauntlet on it. So that those kind of things are possible when you're looking through the silicon in a, in a, in a mixed reality view, which is basically a computer computer image because it's, it's basically generated by the, the cameras well it's, the cameras are filming your real background but your silicon and hardware in this device can do anything on top of that camera image because it's a digital image so i think that's one of the real key things about this device and apple said it themselves it's the first computing device that you look through you don't look at uh, the reality is you're looking at it about three centimeters away from your eyeballs but um that is a big change in the paradigm. So for me, I think this is a really significant historical moment because this device is, you know, a very powerful spatial computing device. It's for sure going to make a 3D room, uh, 3D model of what's around you. It even has, you know, a camera app where you can record memories, they say, um, in, in stereoscopic 3D. Uh, I'm not too sure if that's like a nerf thing going on or if it's just a, a stereoscopic uh, image that you're taking. So that again exists today in the form of uh, you know 180 stereoscopic cameras which you can buy on Amazon or um, yeah so I think that's more going to be more likely going to be like a 3D um, video or photograph that is just taking the two pictures at the same time with some audio for example um, but it's the beginning of I think a long journey I think app developers will do pretty amazing things with this both in the enterprise space, both in the productivity and creative and collaboration space, but also just in the home entertainment space. Um, yeah, they did talk about use cases like watching football games, concerts, all of these kind of things. They've got a huge partnership with Disney. Um, so yeah, it's the beginning of something special. Uh, that's all for me. I'm going to try and cut it off there. I look forward to your comments. and Please add anything in the comments that you think is really significant about this device. Uh, I didn't catch everything, as I said, I was with the kids partially. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy this content and a little chance to see this uh, Vision Pro um, device from, from Apple, which is going to be coming out next year for $3,500, as far as I remember. That's all for now. See you. Bye.